Good evening, Central family, and welcome to the virtual Central York School District Diversity Celebration. My name is Matt Miller, and it is my pleasure to serve as your host this evening. And I hope you will invite your friends and family to watch what will surely be a meaningful, inspiring, and entertaining program. I would like to first introduce Dr. Michael Snell, Superintendent, who will provide opening remarks for us this evening. Good evening and welcome. As Superintendent of Central York School District, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our 14th Annual Diversity Celebration and our first ever virtual event. Our Diversity Celebration celebrates the rich heritage and many talents of our students, faculty, staff, and community. Our 2021 program features entertainment provided by our talented students and staff of all ages. As in previous years, we will welcome to our program an inspiring speaker to provide a keynote message relevant to the work we do each and every day to celebrate the unique differences that make up our Central York community. We will also celebrate your continued support for our mission to provide educational opportunities through which all learners strive to achieve their full potential. On behalf of the district, I thank you for your support of our mission and for joining us to celebrate our district, our schools, our students, and our community. We may not be together in person, but I am thrilled to celebrate this event with you virtually and encourage you to share this program with your family and friends of all ages. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Snell. When we host our in-person program, it is our tradition to involve as many students from our schools as possible in all aspects of our celebration. Tonight is no different. Please join our junior ROTC members from Central York High School and our Central York Middle School Raise Your Voice Chorus members as they present the flag and sing our national anthem. Carrie Colors. Present Colors. Oh, As always, I am amazed and dazzled by the talents of our students and staff. Tonight's program will feature performances representing each of our district's seven schools from grades K to 12. I am pleased to present the first of these special performances and hope you enjoy the Stony Brook Elementary School's Celebration of Diversity. It starts out with a melody and lots of 
Thank you, Stony Brook students and staff, for sharing your talents with us. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Central York Middle School of Vedum Club. My name is Brian Heisey, and I'm one of the advisors for the Vedum Club at Central York Middle School. The Vedum Club at Central York Middle School is comprised of many diverse learners with one goal in mind, to have each other's back. The point of a Vedum Club is to teach about mental health awareness and also suicide awareness and uh, involve positivity whenever we can. We do many activities uh, throughout the building to promote these ideas, but the best thing about a Vedum is it's student-led. But don't take my word for it. Listen to what some of the kids have to say. Vedum offers me a chance to make a difference not only for myself but for others. Now more than ever, mental health concerns cannot be ignored. Avidum allows for learning opportunities surrounding mental health issues and offers strategies for coping with these. I love that Avidum always has my back and I want to make sure I offer someone the comfort of knowing I will do the same. I'm Tom Squanina and I'm a member of Avidum. The word Avidum means I've got your back. To me, that means that we are a community that looks out for one another and welcomes anyone, even if they are struggling. I like that Avidum is a safe space to talk about how you feel and still be accepted. Mental health is important because when you are sad, depressed, or anxious, it can affect your everyday life in a negative way. It is important to be aware of your mental health and get help if you need it. Thank you. This is Amari Play. The Vedum Club to me means I can play a part in helping out the community in many different ways. I can also make a change in people's lives by helping them with their mental health. Mental health is important to me because it can affect your happiness and how you feel. When you don't have good mental health, it may cause you to not be able to live a happy life. This is why it's very important for your mental health to stay good. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sharia Trilog, and I'm from the Century Middle School's Avidum Club. And today, I'm just going to be telling you about it. First off, why is Avidum important? Avidum is important because different students learn many different things. For example, this year, we've already learned about LGBTQ rights and different mental health illnesses, and much, much more. Different people get to share their stories, and I think that helps kids feel less alone. Also, I've joined the Youth Advisory Board for Avidum. It's awesome. You get to share your ideas, and you actually get to build upon them. For example, somebody said, oh my gosh, we should sell masks, and we're actually going to sell masks, which I think is super cool, because instead of this idea going to waste, the Youth Advisory Board with different adults actually helped us build upon it. Mental health is important for a variety of reasons. It affects your physical health and just in general how you interact. Avinam helps many different kids go through many different things. Thank you for your time. My name is Taryn Mariano and I'm in the Century York Middle School Avidam Club. To me, Avidam means family. With Avidam, you can always count on them to listen to your problems and find solutions. Usually in Avidum, you'll hear, I got your back, and I feel like that's so true because Avidum supports you through the thick and thin and always finds solutions. I feel like it's really important to raise awareness about mental illnesses because not many kids or adults know about it, and so they need to know what it is and how to cope with it.
Next, we are excited to have Principal Kafele as our keynote speaker this year. To welcome such a renowned and respected speaker to our district and community is truly an honor. Principal Kafele is one of the most sought after school leadership experts and education presenters in America. Principal Kafele is impacting America's schools. He has delivered over 2,000 conference and program keynotes, professional development workshops, parenting seminars, and student assemblies over his 34 years of public speaking. Principal Kafele brings a reflective approach to delivering his message. It forces his audience to look deeply within themselves toward assessing their own practices to a level of equity. His reflective approach creates a basis for transformative change and improvement. Good evening. This is Principal Kafele. And let me say right from the top, I am deeply honored to be a part of the Central York School District Diversity Celebration. Of course, we wanted this to be in person, on location, but we're, we're living in this pandemic. So with this pandemic, the entire world has shifted. My entire life has shifted, but it's okay. We make it work. So, you know, we're talking about equity, diversity this evening, and I'm entitling this presentation, Equity Matters. And I'll, I'll tell you from the outset, I believe that with everything I have, that equity does in fact matter. It matters with everything about education. Because see, there, there's, there's this, on the one hand, the concept of equity, and on the other hand, the concept of equality. And we're talking about equity versus equality within the classroom. And when we think about equity, we're talking about young people who arrive into a school, arrive into a classroom in different places. So you've got youngsters here, 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 youngsters here. They're all over the place. And thereby their needs are very different. Their needs are varied. Their, their needs in terms of academic needs, social needs, um, emotional needs, you've got various different needs that have to be met by that school, by that teacher. So therefore, it's significant that we look at young people through an equity lens, because we want to meet youngster where youngster is, regardless of whom youngster is. We want to meet that youngster where you are, as you are. Right. So so therefore, the concept of equality. You can't do it because equality says I'm going to treat you equally. I'm going to give you all the same thing. And if we treat everybody the same way and give everybody the same thing, then probably the overwhelming majority of children in a school are going to lose out. Because every, we gave everybody the same thing, for example myself. I'm not an auditory learner by any stretch of the imagination. So if my primary learning comes through my ears and it's new information that I don't have any background knowledge with and thereby have nothing to connect it to, then it's going to go in one ear and right out the other. I'm going, I'm going to lose it. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to retain it because that's not the way that my brain makes sense out of processes information i gotta see it i gotta be visual and for most of this presentation i'm going to give you text because i know that there are visual people who are watching these this presentation so i can't rely on just doing a, a, a message here and speaking to the ear of the entire audience as much as i like doing that as much as i desire to do it i have to take into consideration that there are other modalities of learning that are out there well, it's the same thing in a classroom, and it becomes incumbent upon teacher to determine how do children, the various different children in the classroom, learn? What are their learning strengths? 
How do they best make sense out of information? And if I have I designed this classroom in a way that every youngster has an opportunity to win. Every youngster has an opportunity to succeed, to excel, to maximize their potential. That's a question of equity. See, so, so, so equality in terms of the place it has in a classroom, the goal is equality. We want equality for everybody, but equality can never be the vehicle to get there. The vehicle is equity. So in other words, we never will conclude that because we're an equitable school, we have reached our end game, that we are where we need to be in terms of student achievement. No, we've got the vehicle in place to get to the next level, the next level, the next level. But we have not, we, we have not reached our destiny, our destination until we can reach equality where all young people are achieving at high levels. So keep in mind that difference between equality and equity, that equity is the vehicle to the goal of equality. So, so now let's look at a few things here. I'm just going to bring up this presentation and we will jump right into it. And, and it says, do I bring an equity approach to my instruction? So everything that I do as an educator is always self-reflective. I want my audience to look within themselves. I want teachers, I want principals, I want parents, I want counselors, I want the young people themselves to look within themselves. All the presentations I do use that format is self-reflective, meaning having that mirror handy. But all the books I write are self-reflective, meaning I want the reader to look within oneself not just receive information, but to simultaneously look within one's own practice. What am I doing? The question becomes relative to the question that I just received. So do I bring an equity approach to my instruction? Is equity the vehicle in my classroom? Leaders out there, is ec does equity abound in my school? Counselors out there, my relationships with students, are they equitable? Parents out there, are, when, when you interact with schools, with, 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 with school personnel, are you ensuring that equity is a part of their engagement with your children? So equity matters. But you know, it's, it's interesting because equity, as relevant as it is, it also creates discomfort. There are folks that are just not comfortable in the equity space because equity requires a, a, a whole different thought process, a whole different implementation, a whole different format, a whole different way of doing things. And sometimes that creates uneasiness, tension, discomfort. But I say that moving forward, we have to always be comfortable with being uncomfortable and we've gotta be uncomfortable with being comfortable, right? So that discomfort, we can normalize that. And that's not a bad thing. So again, there, there are folks out there that, that just find this whole equity discussion, this heck equity practice to be somewhat overwhelming, somewhat difficult. But I say in response to that, but you know, although it may be, there's no way of circumventing that. We have to be equitable in our practices if we're serious about educating young people. So my conclusion then is that equity is not solely something that you do. So in other words, the practice of equity. I say it's not limited to that. It's not, that's not solely something that one does, something that one implements. But I say, but equity also has got to be who you are. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying that it's one thing to engage in the practice of equity, but it's another thing to bring an equity mindset to your instruction, an equity mindset to your leadership. See, that's something very different because we can teach 
equity. One can learn equity until next year. We, we, we can teach it and teach it and teach it, learn it, learn it and learn it until there's nothing else to teach and nothing else to learn. But if you're not bringing an equity attitude, an equity mindset to your work, to your practice, it might be all for naught. Because see, you not only must you practice equity, you must be equity. So it, it begs the question then, what is an equity mindset teacher? What does that mean? And, and when I thought about it, because I started using that language, equity mindset, and when I started to research it, I said, hmm, I'm not finding people that are using that language of equity mindset. You know, like when you think about the work of Carol Dweck, when she talked about growth mindset. Well, this word mindset can go with a lot of concepts, a lot of ideas. And in this case, equity. So, so what is an equity mindset? Well, as I'm known to do, if I don't see what I'm looking for, then I will bring it into existence myself. I will create it. So I went on and, and created this definition of an equi equity mindset teacher. And I'm going to read it to you because it's a little, little lengthy, but it's comprehensive. It says an equity mindset teacher is a teacher who utilizes a variety of developmentally appropriate instructional strategies that consider the different academic, social, and emotional needs of all the learners in a student-centered, culturally responsive, and culturally relevant equity mindset classroom where student individuality student cultural identity and student voice matter exponentially. What am I saying? There's a lot there. Let's break it down. And in fact, because of time, I wanna just go right to the bottom. Student individuality, student identity, and that should say student cultural identity and student voice matter. So first, when I say student individuality, I'm talking about the uniqueness of every youngster in a classroom. Every youngster has his or her own uniqueness. Every youngster in the classroom is special. Every youngster in the classroom is bringing their own qualities, their own characteristics, their own individuality into a classroom which can never be denied, never be ignored, never be uh, ne 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 never be suppressed. So with that, I'm saying you and I as the educator, we have to acknowledge that individuality, whether it be on the academic side, the social side, the emotional side, we have to acknowledge that individuality. That's equity. Because if it gets to a point where we've taken them all and just blended them together as one in the name of equality. That what I give one, I give the other. What I give the other, I give the other. And, and, and everybody's getting the same thing. Then we have inadvertently suppressed their individuality because we're treating them as this one monolithic group as opposed to this, this group of youngsters, this plurality where, where, where you've got diversity within a classroom. And I don't mean diversity solely along racial, ethnic, cultural lines, but I mean diversity along human lines, that no two individuals are the same. I've never met anybody like me. I'm me. And, 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 and that makes me unique. So if you've got a classroom that where every student is white, every stu or every student is black, or every student is Latinx, every student is Asian, every student is of the same racial group or, or, or ethnic group or cultural group or nationality, it doesn't mean that you don't have diversity because you do. Because within that group that may be of the same race, they're, they're all different nevertheless. So that student individuality matters. But then second, student cultural identity, that we're not going to suppress nor deny 
the race, ethnicity, culture of the students. No, because see, in the name of equality, like I, I, I've met, I can't count the number of teachers across America that I've met who have told me, I don't see race. I don't look at the race of my students. I don't look at the ethnicity of my students. I don't look at culture of my students. I just see my students. I just see my babies. I say, wow, what a disservice that's being done to those youngsters of that teacher who was colorblind and culture blind. See, no, you can't, you, 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 you've got to have color culture 2020 vision. You've got to see them. You've got to see the individuality of every youngster and realize that race plays so many different roles in terms of how that youngster learns. It cannot be denied. So I'm saying here that instead of suppressing race, we've got to accentuate the race. We've got to illuminate the race, right? So, so, so we, we want, and we want to celebrate it because if we suppress it, then there, there, there's three things that happen here. Now, there, there are more than three, but three I want to highlight. Number one, if we suppress race, ethnicity, cultural identity in the name of, I don't see it. I just see my children. Well, when the, when the dismissal bell rings and the children are leaving for the day and go outside into the world, they're going outside into a world that's going to see everything that that teacher doesn't see or, or said differently, everything the teacher refuses to see. The world's going to see it. But we had the youngster in this artificial environment where we pretended that these differences don't exist. And now we have ill-prepared youngster for a real world out there that is going to see racial, ethnic, cultural differences. No, we want to prepare that youngster to be able to navigate the real world. But secondly, when we deny or suppress, it's equivalent to a student saying without saying the following, teacher, if you don't see my race, you don't see me. And if you don't see me, then you can't effectively teach me. And if you cannot effectively teach me, then why am I in this classroom in the first place? See, in other words, that youngster's racial or ethnic or cultural identity is a large part of his or her overall identity. Why are we going to suppress that? We cannot. We've got to accentuate it. We've got to illuminate it, right? So we've got to celebrate it, right? So we've got to amplify it. We cannot pretend it doesn't exist. But then there's a, a third look here. And that is that your youngsters, in this case, I'm talking about your youngsters of color. They stand on some broad shoulders. They stand on some historical shoulders. They stand on shoulders of people who paved the way before them. We can't, we can't suppress that. We can't marginalize that. We can't distort that. We can't omit that. We can't run away from that because that is a part of their story. And that story dictates to them where they fall along the continuum. But if they don't know the story, then chances are when they look into their mirror, they might not recognize who that is looking back at them historically speaking, culturally speaking. We have to make sure that they, have, that, that they realize who that is in that mirror. But you know one of the biggest challenges to all of this? One of the biggest challenges is that as teacher, in terms of that third one, as teacher, I can't teach what I don't know. Let me say that again. I can't teach what I don't know. I remember when I was a substitute teacher in 1989. So I taught a year, my first year of teaching was in 88. But then in 89, I came, I was in New York in 88. I came back to Jersey, which is my home state in 89 to teach, but I had, but, but they only had substitute positions available. So I subbed and they made me a full-time secondary school 
science sub, building base. I had long-term assignments. I went to human resources and requested that they got me out of that assignment forthwith, immediately. Because I can't teach what I don't know. I, did, I didn't have the, the knowledge base to be proficient in a long-term assignment at the secondary level, teaching science. It, it, when I was an elementary teacher in 88, I was it was elementary and I could, I could learn it and handle it and be able to teach it. But at the secondary level, mm -mm, it's not my area. So they, they made that switch <laughs> drastically uh, quick. So, so that Friday I made the complaint that Monday I was in a new school <laughs> and I didn't never saw a science again. Teacher, you can't teach what you don't know. So there's so much learning that has to occur in order to put you in position to be that teacher that young people need you to be. So, so in other words, it's one thing to have the theory of equity. It's one thing to have the theory of being a culturally relevant practitioner where the youngsters have the opportunity of seeing themselves in the learning. So in other words, whether it be his, uh, uh, social studies, language arts, science, mathematics, that the youngster doesn't walk away from that lesson asking him or herself the question, what does this have to do with me? What does this have to do with my reality? How do I embrace this? How do I take ownership of this? How do I bring this with me after the dismissal bell rings into my life outside of school? What does this have to do with me? I don't see representation of me. And see, that's what we mean when we say being culturally relevant. It doesn't mean a rewrite of curriculum, but it does mean that that master teacher takes curriculum and <laughs> blows life into it. So that now teacher, knowing who's in that classroom, understanding who's in that classroom and ensuring that youngster sees representation of self within the lesson. So when we, when we look at mathematics, for example, in, infusing the social justice component of education into the math, into numbers, so that now the math makes sense relative to my reality. The same thing with the language arts, the same thing with the math, uh, with the science, the same thing with the social studies, that looking at a broader picture, here's an example to take it out of abstraction. I'll, I'll use a, a, a history example or a social studies example. Me growing up, and I'm 60 years old, so I was born in 1960. Me growing up, I never heard ever, K-12, that not one black soldier fought in the American Revolution. I didn't, yeah. so I never, I never had reason to question that. That's the way it was taught. Blacks were enslaved, whites were the enslaved, the enslavers, and 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 and, and white soldiers fought for uh, uh, the colonies' independence from um, from England. So then, as an adult, and I become a voracious reader of African American history, which is the missing component of American history, I might add. I discover that on the colonial side, anywhere from five to 9,000, 5,000 to 9,000 of the troops were black, fighting for not only America's independence, but fighting for their own freedom as they were promised, promised their own emancipation upon victory of the war. But then on the British side, I learned that over 20,000 black troops fought on the British side for the same reason. So you had blacks fighting on both sides for, 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 for Britain to maintain their power or the colonies to, to gain independence from, the, um, from Britain. And then you got black troops on both sides fighting for the same cause, but fighting also for their own freedom. I didn't know that. I didn't, I didn't discover that till I was 23 years old, well out of um, uh, K-12 education and should have been out of undergrad school, but I was what you call a late bloomer, which we don't have time to talk about, right? So, so, so therefore I'm doing all this independent reading. I didn't get this in my, my undergrad courses. <laughs> I'm doing all this independent reading and I come into this, this discovery 
of all this history, which is pretty much every book you see behind me and then the, 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 the hundreds of others throughout this house. And I said, wow. And now I developed an interest in the American Revolution, which I never had. Because I did because I did not know that there were people who looked like myself that had participated and had fought valiantly. Now the American Revolution took on interest for me, but then so did the Civil War because it was the same thing. I had no idea that over 200,000 recently uh, emancipated or freed black people had fought on the Union side to help America to win the Civil War against the South or the Confederacy. It was never taught. I didn't know. But by me learning that at the age of 23, now I'm able to look at the Civil War through a, a, a completely different set of lenses. Right? I, I mean, a, a completely different framework now. Because, and now it became culturally relevant, see? So I just want to draw that to your attention in terms of your students being able to see themselves in the learning, not just receiving information, but understanding what it is that they can do with this information once they receive it. But it's very difficult to absorb all that knowledge if it's presented in a way that it seems to be foreign, right? It doesn't seem to be about me. I don't see I don't see where 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 it speaks to my humanity. I don't see where it speaks to my existence. I don't see where it speaks to my life and my reality. When we talk about a, a true equity classroom, that's what that equity mindset teacher does. That's what that equity mindset leader does. That equity mindset teacher ensures that equity abounds in that classroom and that includes teaching and learning that speaks directly to the students in the classroom. So with that said, I wanna to say to you that I've got about a good 12 hours more of information, but this is a 30 minute address. So I wanna leave it right there and once again say to you that I'm honored to be a part of the diversity celebration. And I, I look forward to coming back um, sometime in the future in person to be able to extend this conversation. So with that being said, I thank you and have a great remainder of the, of the celebration. On behalf of the Central York School District, I want to thank Principal Kefele for being our keynote speaker this evening and for working with us to make this virtual celebration a success. For those of you watching our program at home, I am excited to share that we still have several performances from our talented students and a special presentation featuring another special guest and previous keynote speaker coming up now. Stay with us.
Our next performance features three Central York High School students and Innovations Dance students. Ladies, thank you for sharing your talents with us this evening. It is my pleasure to now introduce Sinking Springs Elementary School's Poppy and Zoe, who will perform America the Beautiful on piano. Hi, I'm Zoe. And I'm Poppy. Today I will be playing America the Beautiful. We hope you enjoy and thank you for listening. Thank you ladies for a wonderful piano performance. It is my pleasure to now introduce a talented group of Central York Middle School dancers. I hope you enjoy their step performance as much as I know I will. I started this step team because I believe you should turn your dreams into reality and I was inspired by step team on YouTube. No, we do not have a step team here, so I decided to make one. So I started a step team obviously to support J-Lo and because I wasn't involved in anything else. So when I heard about the step team, I wanted to join, so I had something to do and joining excited me and I learned everything new. And yeah.
Thank you, middle school steppers, for your awesome performance. Our final student performance tonight features the talents of our K3 students from across the district performing a special celebration of diversity. Please join me in welcoming our K3 group. The circles in the green circle represent our social world and how we treat others. It's like the golden rule, treat others the way you want to be treated. These circles are green because they connect to nature. Our green things in nature grow, oh, and we want our social circles to grow. We grow the circles by showing others caring, sharing, and respect. I feel happy when I'm in someone's green circle. The green circle means that you have more friends because you are very nice to people. Being nice to others that are different from me, accepting others that look and act different from me. Everybody is different in beautiful ways. We are all different on the outside. In, on the inside, we are all the same. All skin colors are beautiful no matter what. We can still do a lot of things in 2021 to make everyone's green circle grow. I'm a Panther Buddy and I help all, all new students and help them be in a um, big green circle. Being in the green circle is terrific. The green circle grows by turning caring, sharing, and respect into actions. If you're the nicest one, they'll get in your circle. Thank you is a kind word. We share our friendship by giving air hugs. Air hug! Not talking behind others' backs and giving a finger wave to others. Think our way. Saying kind things and encouraging others. Welcoming new friends into the green circle. I feel happy when I'm in a green circle. We respect others that are different from ourselves by not making fun of them, listening to their stories, and trying to understand them. I belong, I belong in the green circle. I belong in the green circle. I belong in the green circle. Is I'm not the same as others, so we so we don't get everyone mixed up. I'm special. I'm my parents, my family think I'm perfect the way I am. My classmates think I'm funny. I'm a I'm a really good dancer. When our green circle grows, we can grow up to do great things. When I grow up, I'm going to be an NFL player because me and my family, we always go um, and sit down on the couch and watch football every day. When I grow up, I want to be a pizza maker because I think it's a family legacy. I'm going to be a teacher to grow up, to um, make kids happy. I'm going to be a cheerleader when I grow up, to cheer people on, because I love doing it. Yeah! I want to be a superhero when I grow up, because they're powerful. We love the Green Circle! This concludes our entertainment portion of this year's program, but we have more in store for you. I am pleased to welcome 
Ms. Delma Rivera Lytle, Diversity Specialist, who will introduce our Resiliency Award presentation. Good evening, my name is Delma Rivera Lytle. I am a diversity education specialist at Central York School District and have served as the coordinator of the annual district diversity celebration for the past 15 years. One of the highlights of our diversity celebration has been our keynote speaker. Our speakers have left an enduring legacy to our students, their families, and our York community with their inspirational messages. In 2012, Central was honored to have former Penn State football player Adam Talaferro serve as our keynote speaker. You don't have to be a Penn State fan to love Adam Talaferro. You love him for his inspirational words, his humbleness, and his resiliency in the face of unimaginable odds. Adam Talaferro was a cornerback for the Penn State Nittany Lions. He was paralyzed while making a tackle during this game at Ohio State in 2000. After spinal fusion surgery, doctors told Adam's parents their son would probably never walk again. Three months later, the miracle was completed as Adam walked out of McGee Rehabilitation Hospital in Philadelphia. His recovery gained national media attention. He never played football again, but the following year led the Penn State football team onto the field to start the season. His miracle continued as he went on to graduate from Penn State, Rutgers Law School, and a career with Bristol Myers Squibb, one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies. He also serves as a member of the New Jersey General Assembly. Adam created the Adam Talaferro Foundation, providing emotional, financial, and educational support to individuals who suffer catastrophic head or spinal injuries. His journey is also chronicled in the book, Miracle in the Making, The Adam Talaferro Story. Being inspired by his story, his resiliency and fearless attitude, I reached out to Adam for permission to create an award that would be presented to a central student or group of students who embodied his resiliency, overcoming odds that many of us as adults couldn't even imagine overcoming. He immediately said yes. The first recipient in 2012, Kirtra Moscato, brought us all to tears as we shared his story. Adam presented the award that first year, and we have since continued the award presentation at every diversity celebration. It is my honor and privilege to introduce my friend, Adam Talaferro, as he presents the award to this year's winner. Please enjoy this short video clip about Adam's story prior to the award presentation. Wayne Sebastianelli, the team doctor, he told Adam not just what to do, but what not to do. And Adam's walking out now to the tunnel. And every head here at Beaver Stadium is, is turned in that direction right now, waiting for him to come out. That right hand of his is still a little bit stiff, but remember, he never rehabbed his thumb from the preseason when he heard it last year. He's slapping Ladies and hands gentlemen, in that tunnel. he has been an inspiration They're to his teammates, down here all Penn Staters, and thousands of others for his up, courage, tireless work, better way. and determination to return to the field tonight. Crowd, Ladies and gentlemen, here at please Stadium. welcome Penn State's number 43, man. Adam Talaferro. September 23rd in Columbus. We all wondered if it would be possible that he would do this. And here he is. He said he would do it. Flash bulbs all around the stadium. Now he's going to run. Hi, my name is Adam Talaferro. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor and a privilege to join the, the Central York School District and presenting the Resiliency Award, which is named after me. And uh, I can't tell you how, how much of, a, uh, of an honor it is to be with you all. But as most of you know, the journey to become, becoming a unified champion school began with one seemingly small step many years ago. The Central York School District had a vision to provide a meaningful instruction to all learners. And in 2012, the school board made the decision to move forward with that vision. The very first step was to open one K through three autistic support classroom. Since the opening of this first classroom, CYSD has opened classrooms to support individuals with autism and intellectual disability through age 21. In the past few years, Central's school communities have embraced these unique learners. Families shared that their children were greeted by peers in the community, 
Learners were greeted in the hallways by name and new relationships were being formed every day. But even with all of this growth and acceptance, there was still one piece missing. That's engagement in extracurricular activities. Many of the learners in central specialized programs participated in Special Olympics of York County where they excelled in many sports. Some learners participated as managers or assistants on school teams, but there were no clubs or sports that required participation of individuals with disabilities as equals. This all changed during the 2018-2019 school year. In the fall of 2018, a team of staff from Central York High School began meeting with liaisons from Special Olympics Pennsylvania to learn more about the Unified Champion Schools programs. The Unified Champion School program's focus was to create an inclusive club and sports team. The club and sports teams were not created for individuals with disabilities, but with, but with them. Every member of the club or team would have an active role and an active voice. Athletes competed together based on their athletic abilities, not cognitive or social abilities. The Central York High School team was extremely excited about this program and jumped at the chance to get it started. In January of 2019, Central York School Board was excited to approve the addition of a Special Olympics Unified Track and Field team at Central York High School. Unified Track and Field is a PIAA recognized interscholastic sport, which is co-ed and combines athletes who are Special Olympics eligible and athletes without intellectual disabilities. Each athlete competes in, in races or field events according to their qualifying time or distance without regard to their cognitive ability. This creates an opportunity for true teamwork and support. Also, in the beginning of 2019, the Youth Activation Committee was formed as a club at Central York High School. The original mission of the club was to develop leadership and self-advocacy skills in committee members so that they, they, so that they could lead others into becoming more inclusive. The YIC club focused on creating engagement activities within the whole school community. The club also has co-leadership positions to ensure representation of all stakeholders. After a very successful first season of unified track and field, Central York School District was asked by Special Olympics to begin a second unified sport. This is very high praise as it typically takes three years to establish a program able to support two sports. In the fall of 2019, Central York School District added a unified bocce team. The team consisted of athletes eligible for Special Olympics and those with intellectual disabilities. As a unified team, the athletes compete as equal team members. With the addition of the Unified Champion Schools program, we have seen tremendous growth in the athletes, club members, and school community. We have hundreds of students and staff pledged to support inclusive practices during the Global Spread the Word Day. Learners have accepted responsibility for running fundraisers. Learners who were once anxious and felt excluded now speak up and seek out special, special social opportunities. This program has truly brought out the best in all learners. Thanks to our coaches, Sarah Bolger, Kelly Dickmeyer, and Shelly Warfield from Unified Track. Coaches Matt Astorino and Andy Casale from Bocce Ball. YAC club advisors, Katie Anderson and Keely Dickmeyer, and all our athletes, partners, and club members who have helped Central York become a unified champion school. So on behalf of myself and all the other folks that the unified sports teams have inspired, I just wanna say congratulations to you on, on being awarded this year's Resiliency Award. And I look forward to come watching you guys play and thank you for everything that you do for, for those in the community. And it's people like you all that make this world a better place. So thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. Before we conclude this program, I want to take a moment and thank the team who put together tonight's first ever virtual diversity celebration. Tonight's program would not have been possible without the time and talents and dedication of our diversity specialists. 
Ms. Clydeen Francis, and Ms. Delma Rivera Lytle. We are grateful to you for all you do for our students year round and for your commitment to providing our Central York community with an annual event that celebrates the unique and special talents of our students, staff, and community. I would also like to thank our incredible students and staff who created pre-recorded performances and speeches. We appreciate your time and your willingness to share your talents with our community and help us celebrate diversity. Finally, thank you to all of you who watch this program. We are so sorry we could not be together in person this year, but we hope you found these virtual performances, speeches, and presentations meaningful, inspiring, and enjoyable. This celebration will be available for future viewing and sharing using the same link you used to see it tonight. And we encourage you to share it with your friends and families so they too can celebrate our Panther family through this program. On behalf of Central York School District, thank you for your continued support and for making it be a great day to be a Panther today and every day. Good night.